Hey everyone, welcome to session 82 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. I am joined today by Beth McKee. She wears so many hats that I have to actually look at a list to get them all correct. Uh, first of all, she's the Director of Rehab Services at Guangzhou A International Children's Center, which is in the Hunan province of China. And we talk about all the work that she's doing over there, how she got started working in China, and how she manages to support this center uh, in uh, uh, going over there for a couple of weeks at a time and going back and forth and things like that. Um, she's also the chief executive officer of ABA Consulting International, and she's the brand ambassador of Behavior Me, uh, which we'll learn more about towards the end of the podcast. So um, it's a it's a fun conversation. There are lessons aplenty, whether or not you're considering working overseas or not. Uh, there's a lot of lessons about staff training, uh, 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 scaling an agency, uh, cultural competence. I could go on and on, but I think we'll just let the conversation unfold, and I think you'll enjoy it as much as I did. Before we get to the episode, I do want to let you know that we are brought to you today by HRI Recruiters. So if you're looking for your dream job or if you're an agency looking for your dream candidate, go to hricolorado.com and hit the contact tab to schedule a confidential conversation with Barb Voss. And uh, I also want to let you know that uh, our book is out. What book do you ask? Oh, the book that I co-wrote with Dr. Lisa Britton. And it is available at lsevier.com where you can find it for the best price I think that's around. It's also available on Amazon too. If you do get it, Take a picture of it and uh, tag me on Instagram. I am at Behavioral Observations. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, that would be fun to see the books in the wild, if you will. So, uh, And if you do get it and you enjoy it, uh, do please leave a review on Amazon or wherever you happen to purchase it so you can let other people know that you find it useful. So um, I think that's it for opening remarks. So without any further delay, let's get to this fun conversation with Beth McKee. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Beth McKee, welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing today? Good. Hello, Matt. How are you? Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, the pleasure is mine. Um, I first came across uh, the stuff that you're doing, uh, I think, through Instagram, because you would post all these cool pictures about being in China and things along those lines. And I deduced, I guess, from the pictures that you were doing some work over there. And I think we started uh, messaging here uh, about coming on the podcast. And then uh, I think uh, one month went to the other and, you know, <laughs> we were finally circled back and uh, kind of made this happen. So I know we're not going to talk about China exclusively here, but uh, we could certainly, the idea of, of, of practicing behavior analysis in different cultures is, um, I think, very interesting topic. So having said that, again, welcome and uh, thanks for joining me today. Sure. Happy to be here. So with that in mind, um, what, did, um, what did you do to get into ABA? What, what was your first experience uh, in terms of uh, whether it's classwork or job related or whatever? How did you discover the um, uh, applied behavior analysis? Okay. So, well, it was during my master's program. Uh, at, at Hofstra University in Long Island, um, and I was mastering in special education at that point, and part of that is doing a graduate uh, internship. Um, and so it's a little bit of a convoluted story, but interesting nonetheless, I suppose. Um, so I was providing respite care for a family on Long Island with a child with autism. Um, and so the mom kind of told me that I was putting some consequences in place and that I was reinforcing some good behavior and I was using his natural interests. And she was like, Oh, you were really good at this, this ABA stuff that my, my son's receiving. You should look more into ABA. And so I had no idea what she was talking about. I saw this 
three big Brit, uh, three ring binder that was really big. And I saw a cabinet that was full of candy. Um, and I knew that had something to his, with, to do with his programs. I looked in the binder and I had no idea what it was. Um, and of course that was probably like 20 something years ago. So at that point it was book, a book full of what I would now know of just 10 blocks of discrete trial teaching. So, so Uh, you you were doing some respite, but the, the, you're at least from the mom's perspective, uh, I guess interacting with the, the 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 child systematically enough that it looked a lot like it. So, long story short, it sounds like you're kind of like a you had some natural inclination towards I this. I had some natural natural inclinations. I went on and was talking to my friend about some things um, in that environment and talked to her about this ABA piece, and she said, "Well." My uh, friend, Joanne Gerenzer, who was at Eden 2, um, was her camp counselor when she was an adolescent. She said, let me reach out to her. And she said, Beth, you should do that internship you have to do at this school. They're doing really cool stuff. So she kind of hooked me up and I got to do my internship um, at the Genesis School in Long Island. And there I was exposed to people like Mary McDonald and Ruth Donlin and Randy Horowitz, who were... To me, these amazing women who were dedicated to this science, um, and I was put in a classroom, and I was exposed to so many things. So there were behavior contracts going on in there, and there were DRs going on in there. And I thought, well, this is really cool stuff and what's going on in here, this idea of using data um, to look at essentially the perspective was educator accountability. Um, and I really liked those two things coming together. So I was hooked, um, in terms of the science, the strong ethics that I saw, um, being implemented there, the intense commitment to families and individuals and the context of the family. And I thought, and the team building staff training. And I thought, okay, this is my jam. This is it. I found my thing. I was like, I was like a kid in a candy store at that point. I didn't know much about it. I just knew it was something cool and I wanted to be like these amazing women. So um, that's how I got into it. I did the first ABA internship at Hofstra there. And now Mary McDonald is actually has an ABA program at Hofstra. So that's really cool to years later hear that that kind of connection um, is happening so well. So that's how I got into it. Um, And I pursued ABA from there. I see. So... uh what is it that you're doing these days, I guess, uh, and, and let's talk about how you also got into doing some work in China. I, I want to hear the story about how that developed. So if you can kind of bring us up to speed from, I guess, the 90s to uh, 2019. <laughs> so, okay. that... so we'll really take a big leap forward in That's time. Right. Um, and I end up living in Arkansas, um, and working at a nonprofit here. Um, and I have a friend, um, who has, um, a company here that provides uh, speech OT and PT. And she was linked up with someone who is from China. That person's name is Dr. Lin and he lives, uh, in Northwest Arkansas. And his family is from this city in in China called Changsha, which is in Hunan province. And um, he essentially is going back and beginning a a clinic um, to address needs in his community under his mother's um, direction. Her name is Dr. Liu. Dr. Liu is a director of a rehabilitation, I'm sorry, director of a hospital Um, that focuses on genetics and reproduction research and health. And so she said to her son, Dr. Lin, uh, come on back and and get this clinic going. And so he did. And so he sought out the help of providers in my local community. I was one of those providers who was recommended to him. So he sent me an email, came across in my email, it said, China. Now, I have a little bit of a history with China because my father's best friend um, is Chinese and Taiwanese and lives in China. Um, And my father also worked and lived in China for five years. So, and my sister-in-law is Chinese. So, the culture is not new to me. It's something that I've always been um, enamored with. Um, I, in fact, had gone over and, and 
visited China for five weeks years ago when my father was working there and just loved it. I just love the culture. Um, and so when Dr. Lin asked me, I was more than excited uh, to find out what this endeavor was about. At that point, I started just kind of going over and volunteering and consulting a little bit. Um, and I would go over there and run some workshops um, and do a little bit of training. And it was um, translated simultaneously. Um, but there were a handful of the staff there that, that spoke some English. So that's oh. how my relationship got started with Dr. Lin. I see. So let's um, back up just a second. You said when you were working over there, you're because I want to get into the language barrier. So we might as well uh, do that okay. right now. Yeah. So uh, you said you're what you were doing was being translated simultaneously. So give us an example of how that might look. So I would um, have my PowerPoint in English, and um, most times it was also translated into Chinese. So they would have a Chinese version. I have my English version. I would speak in English. Pause. And then translate, it would be translated into Mandarin. Then when I was doing anything else there, um, interacting with family, sometimes I had a translator with me. And um, so that's how it worked. And so there, you kind of find your, um, you kind of find a, a translating relationship that is better with some people than others. Um, and it just kind of naturally evolves from there where you both kind of prefer each other in terms of translations. Mm -hmm. Um, and you just kind of fall into this natural rhythm. That's what's happened to me with, with trans, with translating anyway. So. And, and what, what kind of work were you doing? Were you doing like behavioral interventions to reduce problematic behaviors? Oh, so were you doing language acquisition? Were you doing kind of like the full, full spectrum of, uh, ABA, uh, services, so began, if you will. Yeah, I can kind of began with an overview of the science, um, the kind of topics I would really, Dr. Lin would kind of tell me what he wanted, and then he would give, want me to give feedback on, on what my opinion was as to what his team would need. Um, so they wanted language, they wanted assessments, um, and how to use reinforcement effectively. So, of course, that got into whole, the whole uh, pairing and motivating operations piece at that point. Um, and this was a really small group. Um, he had, at that time, three. He had three people at that time who were wanting to begin to use um, ABA with children um, in an intensive capacity. So that's how it began. Uh, it evolved from there into um, a relationship where they wanted to, when I say they, I mean his, Dr. Lin and his mother, Dr. Liu, wanted to begin to establish a bigger clinic and have a more formal um, training um, and have me have a more formal uh, super supervisory role. And so it evolved from there into an actual job, which at, at the time um, was something that I was, I was really needing a change. Um, I had been with the organization um, that I was with for eight years and I was just really ready for a new challenge. Um, and so this was going to be a big, new, exciting challenge. I see. And so what is your schedule? Because you're speaking to me from Arkansas right now, so you're not in China. And right. um, what, so, and, and I know just, I guess, from uh, uh, seeing the uh, the various posts that sometimes, you know, you're, you're back stateside, sometimes you're in China and things like that. So what does what is, what is the routine look like? What does the schedule look like in terms of how, how frequently you're there and, and back and whatnot? Sure. So I'm into it a year now. Um, in fact, I just had my year anniversary a month ago. Um, and so the, the schedule is that I'm there anywhere from eight to 10 times per year. Um, and I go for two to three weeks at a time. Um, and so when I'm there, I'm working, um, and really have this past year been focused on the training piece, uh, and had a group of five uh, staff who I was training intensively at a supervisor level. Um, so not training at a tech level, but going beyond that. Um, and 
then when I'm back, I'm not working. So that gave me time. Why this was so appealing is it gave me time to do a lot of other things that I wanted to do and get in other projects. I'm involved in my state organization, um, ARC ABBA, um, and I'm also involved in some other things. And so this gave me an outlet for my creativity um, and to be able to pursue other things that I want to pursue within the field of behavior analysis and not necessarily having to do with autism. Cool. So um, let's talk about the training. Uh, I know we talked a little bit about how the translation goes. Um, is that still the case or are the people that you're working with more proficient in English or, or are you becoming more proficient in, in, in Mandarin or, uh, you know, is this, wow. you know. Let's see. So last year I probably start at, I started at like a 16 month old level. <laughs> In Mandarin, I'm now at probably a pre-K <laughs> level in Mandarin. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not proficient enough to have a conversation. Um, I hope that's something that I, I can get to in the future. I have a translator. Um, and the translator, um, her name is Liang, and she has her master's in psychology. She is also one of my supervisees. And when I say supervisee, I'm not talking about um, in the capacity of, um, of, the, of the board. Right. They're not in a verified is, course sequence. They're not sitting no. for, not preparing to sit for the exam, et cetera. No, no. These are just, um, these are staff who I am supervising directly in applied behavior analysis. Now, I am supervising them as if they were going to become candidates. So that's an important thing to know. Um, they're not getting any hours, but I'm going along as if I'm working to that level. Mm-hmm. So, um, so go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and, um, so tell us a little bit about y the, 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 the training that you, you do. Um, um, what I'm really interested in is that, you know, obviously if you're not there for a couple of weeks is the opportunity for some level of procedural drift or, uh, and all sorts of other things that could come to visit upon them. Right. Um, you know, so, so how do you, when, when you're, when you're training in this context, how do you guard against those sorts of things or, or, or do you, or do you have to go, you know, do you find you have to kind of clean up a bunch of things when you get back right. or that's a great question. So that's why last year I dedicated my time to training up these five individuals to that supervisor level. And part of that, um, was focusing for me a, a lot on getting them to be fluent in motivating operations. Um, and, and so I, I, I spent a lot of time in that, um, and we would have intensive training sessions. And when I say intensive, I'm talking about six hour days. Um, and so I would kind of go through the task list, um, and also just use my experience with past supervision, um, and develop these trainings. Now, some of its procedure, of course, um, but there's also the principles, right? So the once the principles are, are the person's fluent in the principles, the procedures in my mind kind of come second, because if you can have a firm understanding and are fluent in your understanding, the application comes easier. Sure. Now it's interesting because I did it backwards in my own career <laughs> a little bit. Um, but so I knew that there was a really important piece with those, that MO, but so in terms of the, the treatment drifts, I just built, um, all kinds of procedures. Um, and every procedure that we use, there's also a treatment integrity checklist. And so I just use behavior skills training, um, when we would address procedures and, go right through. And so they also have access to the, um, treatment fidelity checklist, which everything that I do is translated by Liang and some other members on our team into Mandarin. So they have, they're both hearing it and they're reading it. Um, and then when they're practicing it, sometimes they'll practice out loud in English. Um, if they, if they're having a harder time, then I say, go ahead and speak in Chinese. And Liang is way further ahead than a lot of the group. And so she's able to do, give me the feedback. And then we kind of do an error analysis together about where someone's struggling and um, give feedback that way. 
Are you looking for a new job, but you're overwhelmed with all the emails that you're getting from various ABA agencies? What if there was someone who was in your corner and could help you find the perfect job placement? Well, that person exists. Barbara Voss has been working as a recruiter for over 30 years, and her company, HRIC, specializes in placing BCBAs in permanent full-time positions throughout the United States. Barbara has been placing BCBAs since 2011, so she knows our business, and she offers personalized service to any BCBA looking for a new position. She also helps companies looking to hire BCBAs, too. Here are just some of the things Barbara can help you with. She can provide information about salary ranges in different markets across the country. She can help you write your resume. She can coordinate and prepare you for the interview process and even help negotiate the right salary for you. And best of all, there are no charges to any candidate for all of these services. When you are ready to make a change and want to work with someone who will listen to you and understand what you need in a new position, contact Barbara at HRIC. To schedule a confidential discussion, head over to hricolorado.com. Again, that's hricolorado.com, and hit the contact button to connect with Barbara. You won't be disappointed. That's cool. Um, uh, What um, are are there? I'm sure there's numerous cultural lessons uh, as it relates to working in a in a foreign country um was there any and uh, was there a is that assumption correct and b uh what what are some things that surprised you perhaps or things that you didn't expect um or, or, or interesting things that you've learned along the way about you know working uh whether it's in in a in, in this particular culture or just working outside of your own kind of uh, language uh ecosystem right um so i think what i always find surprising in the best of ways is the respect that, that the Chinese culture shows for their elders. And so (laughs) I happen to unfortunately fall into the elder category (laughs) with the people that I'm working with. Um, and so I get to kind of be on the receiving end of that as well as the respect for Loban, which is a term for, uh, um, and Laosha, which is a term for boss and a term for teacher. So I am both their kind of teacher and boss, but I was their teacher first. Um, and because of my age and because of the, the teacher capacity, there is a respect, um, that the students, in part on me that is always just it's so lovely but it's it's also jarring at the same time a little bit um so and then and then of course for grandparents you see families come in with grandparents into the clinic and just you you can actually watch the interactions they make sure everyone has you know their seat first um and they're very gracious to the older generation in all kinds of ways. And so I always find that kind of endearing. Um, but in terms of my capacity, is it is a little bit jarring, like, oh, no, no, you don't have to do that. You don't have to call me. Don't call me boss. <laughs> you can just call me Beth. Um, so the other thing I would say, though, that's really different in terms of parenting, what I see is that um, there is very strong discipline. Um, often used. Now, this is my experience. I'm not talking for the entire country. This is merely my experience. This is merely anecdotal. You know, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I want to emphasize that uh, later on is that, you know, um, if someone, you know, was in New England or the South or the Mountain West states or something like that and then, you know, extrapolated some rule or something like that it may not necessarily be applicable to all those different places and it's that's correct we don't want to we don't want to uh, uh look at the the chinese or any other culture for that matter the same way and you know there's there's you know i'm it's a ginormous country that spans many time zones and has different right you know, with many different um areas just like we do and just like we have different pockets of kind of things that are specific to our regional culture, the same is, is true. And even within cities and across cities. Um, so that's definitely true. So my experience in terms of, of the parenting thing, um, is, is a, a strong discipline, um, loud discipline, 
Um, and so, you, you know, you will see, I have seen, um, parents kind of yelling at their kids, their little, (laughs) their little kids. And so that is different. Whereas in the U S, um, you know, we don't, I don't necessarily, I shouldn't say we, I haven't necessarily seen, uh, or I've seen more of a disc, a decline in that kind of style of parenting and more of an issue with, with, with wanting parents to put more boundaries in, in the U S and I see really more of an adherence to really strong boundaries, um, in China. Um, so the challenges for us at the clinic are a little bit different than the challenges that I was experiencing, um, in terms of working with parents, um, where some of that work in the U S is, is working with parents to be able to put, get a little bit more comfortable in putting boundaries in. And in China, we're kind of like help (laughs) working to help the parents be somewhat more flexible flexible slowly. Of course, we do demand fading with our parents too. Um, and we also do the same thing that we do in the US, US which is look at the context um, and the culture of each family and, and what that is for that child in the context of that family. That's no different. I see. And, and so um, talk, talk a little bit more about the clinic itself. Uh, you know, how many how many uh, uh, clients are, are being seen, and you know what are the what are the challenges that are coming in to uh, get addressed, and things like okay. that. So the clinic, um, I'm in my first year there, but the clinic, I think they are probably on year four or five. I'm going to go with five. Um, and the, the clinic is, has well child. They do assessment and diagnostics, um, for children. And then they provide speech PT, OT and an ABA program. Um, and so I was tasked with, um, kind of bringing technology, behavior analytic technologies to this clinic. Um, and also, implementing behavior analysis across the clinic. So across disciplines and including the administration. Um, and so in the ABA program, we are serving this past year, we served four children, um, and they did so well. Um, let me tell you a little bit about about a dynamic of the clinic. So we now have a wait list of 50 children just from serving those four. But the reason that has happened is because the families, when they come, there's a family waiting room and the family may come and their child may start at eight in the morning and they may start with PT and have speech and have OT, or there may be a speech OT, a lunch, and then come back and have And so the families sit while their children um, are in their treatment sessions. And so they see one another and they interact with one another. And so the families that were coming for our, for the behavior analytics services, well, these families saw these children come in and have a hard time entering the building, maybe not being able to have any form of greetings, not following their parents' instructions, um, you know, kind of those simple, simple things that we see, want to see in early learners. And they got to see those behaviors evolve. Also some children who had, um, levels of stereotypy. And I know this is kind of a hot topic right now, but this is levels of stereotypy that did in fact interfere with child's, um, ability to learn. And so was being treated actively and mom was involved in the treatment and really successful in implementation. Um, and so they also saw that child go from having really high rates of, of interfering stereotypy to levels that allowed him to interact with his parents and begin to seek out peer relationships um, and go from not speaking to speaking. And so they were seeing all of this in course. And they told their friends who told their friends. And before you know it, we have, um, a wait list of 50 and probably I haven't checked in recently. I wouldn't be surprised if it's grown since then. So that's, I I don't like having a wait list of course. Um, and so we're going to be working on it. So the goal will be to move up to, uh, providing services for 15 this year. And the end goal will be for providing family, uh, uh, services to 50 families, but that's going to, that's going to take time. Wow. Wow. Um, so this year, my job for this new uh, this new year is um, 
focusing really uh, on putting all of the systems in place. Um, really excited. We got our ethical uh, guidelines were approved at the administrative level in the hospital. They loved them so much that they wanted to, to um, choose ethical guidelines that could work within the hospital setting. So that's turned into another project. <laughs> um, so I've been working really hard this year on putting kind of the OBM structures in place um, to be able to support that. We knew, I knew all along that it was, you know, that there was kind of a bigger picture. And so we've been building in such a way that it would be scalable. So, um, so that's the focus this year is, is really, uh, making sure that we're, we'll be positioned to be able to, to handle that. I don't want it to be an afterthought to kind of go back and, and try and clean that up. Um, so. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you can speak to this, but I'm just curious as to what the brand, if you will, of ABA or how it's regarded in, 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 uh, again, I'm making a general reference to the yeah, country no, China, yeah, and I'm sure. going to try not to do that. But like, you know, in your travels, I guess, and if you if you if you're uh, interacting with people, and you say, "Oh, I'm a behavior analyst," and then you go through, the, you know, what we all go through, and you know, n- ten minutes later, once you finish describing what that means to people, um, you know, is is there a sense of of yeah. How the field is regarded, um, or, or the extent to which it's even known. I mean, it's it's you know, um, yeah. T- tell us what it's like to be, I guess, a behavior analyst in, in in China, especially when you're not in the clinic and you're in an area where you're not. I guess people don't know exactly what you're doing. Sure, sure. Um, so, behavior analysis. My experience has been that people either know absolutely nothing, nothing at all, or they have some idea that has something to do with autism. Those have been my, my kind of two experiences. Um, and part of the reason I was also excited to take this project is, is the idea of going in and training somebody, staff who won't necessarily have a history. That's really exciting because I can kind of do it, quote, my way yeah. um, from the get-go and not having to kind of work through all of that. Um, so, so that's really been my experience is kind of no, no idea at all. Um, or that it's this, this something that has to do with autism, um, in China, in terms of treatment for children with autism, there are, there are special schools, um, in the community. And then there are schools, schools. Now I have only heard this And again, I'm speaking to my own experience, not for the entire country. Um, There are schools that just tell the parents that they just, their child just can't come there. And so um, there are children who are at home. There are special schools for, uh, apparently for children with special needs. Um, And so lots of parents don't choose to use that option. Hmm. And so are looking. Um, We have some parents who are really motivated. And so that once they are learning about treatment, they start seeking out, um, information and research, uh, resources and are really kind of gung ho about like, give me the procedure, tell me what to do. How can I help? What should this look like at home? Um, and are really, really highly motivated, um, to help their, their child. Um, so, so that's been my experience. Um, we have a relationship with a local university there. Um, it's called Hunan Normal University, um, and that is through Dr. Liu. So Dr. Liu set up a relationship between the hospital, the clinic, and the um, – I think it's the Department of Psychology. So we also go over and do some dissemination of behavior analysis um, at the university level. And so that's another part of my job um, that is is really fun where I get to go and talk about the science and educate people. Now, we're working really hard on trying to avoid the trap of having um, behavior analysis just become known for treatment and autism. So I always really work hard to kind of work that those examples in. I was glad to hear uh, the board is going to be adding some things on their website about different aspects um, of behavior analysis. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jim was just speaking at APBA about resources that are going to be there. So I'm excited to get my hands on those new resources and be able to kind of incorporate those um, into the trainings as exemplars of what else do behavior analysts do? This is not just, you know, an autism specific science. I see. What is, um, what, what is the typical psychology 
department, uh, I guess, uh, what at least for this particular university, what is what type of psychology do they teach? Is it is it uh, yeah, well, yes, I'm, educational psychology? I see. And is it using like um, and 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 so when you talk about behavior analysis to them. Um, it, is there a philosophical resistance based off of maybe like, uh, you know, mistaken impressions or, or, or perhaps bad modeling of, of behavior analysis from others or, or what have you? Not in the community that I'm in. Not, not at all. It, there's more. And again, so I'm the presenter, so I don't know. Um, and beca- and be- I think also because of the other piece of what I was telling you in terms of if you're having a speaker come in who's being introduced quote, as, an, as a quote expert, which, you know, whatever, that's neither here nor there. Um, my sense would be that someone's not going to necessarily be confrontational culturally. Um, so I may not be getting the best kind of idea on that, but it has not been my experience that, that I'm hearing that kind of feedback. So, I so it's not like ABAI where someone will get up and start talking at you in the middle of your time. <laughs> yeah. So it's not that <laughs> exactly. Um, or even afterwards, um, I get groups of people afterwards who are really excited and are trying to ask me questions and are like wanting to begin tomorrow. Um, um, and so trying to like explain that this is like, this is something I went to school for it's experience and it's not going to be like, I can't kind of give you pointers to have you start doing something tomorrow or them wanting to come in and start working at the clinic tomorrow. <laughs> um, so it's, it's more of an excitement about what is this um, and how, you know, how, how are you kind of quote getting to kids to do these things? Because we've also shown um, our, Yes, our standard acceleration charts. I am a PT um, and, <laughs> um, and so showing our charts, explaining, you know, showing those slopes and then showing before and after videos. And so the students get to see those and they just are, you know, they're really excited. So that's that's been my experience so far. Um, but we'll see as I keep going along. I'm, I'm sure I'll have all kinds of experiences. Hey everyone, as a BCBA, meeting your continuing ed needs can be challenging at times. That's why I have made selected episodes of the Behavioral Observations podcast available for Type 2 continuing education credits. That's right. You can meet a portion of your professional development requirements on the go. Currently, we have CEs for topics including functional assessment, ethics, and supervision. Come learn from podcast favorites such as Greg Hanley, Pat Fryman, Mark Dixon, as well as many other amazing guests. For more information, head on over to behavioralobservations.com forward slash get CEs. Oh, just, it's utterly fascinating. Um, I, I'm wondering if the deference for boss slash teacher, does that translate into perhaps an increased level of procedural integrity uh, Absolutely you know, or not. work ethic or whatever you want to call it? Absolutely. It is that it actually that would have been something I could have commented when you had asked me what uh, in terms of the so what's surprising is it does translate into that. And so they're really motivated to work really hard. And I, you know, they'll go out of my way to do something that I hadn't expected. I maybe mentioned I needed something, then boom, it's on my on my desk. And I'll say, Oh, my gosh, well, thank you. um, Seven or whatever the name they all also wanted me to give them American names. Well, that's, we can have that piece of discussion in a second. Um, <laughs> All right. We'll get back to that. Yeah. 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 And I'll say, Oh, thank you. So-and-so and literally get like a little bit of a bow and right in my eyes, eye to eye contact. And it is my absolute pleasure. And I'm just like, that's when I'm just like floored. Like they didn't have to do that. It was something I mentioned. I could have gotten it on my own, but it's an above and beyond kind of scenario. And yes, in terms of treatment fidelity, they take their, what they're doing to be really serious. And it is the case that, you know, here's an American coming in here, flying all the way over. And so they think that they're part of something really special. And I feel that I'm part of something special, having the honor of being able to do this job and be able to bring this science uh, to this community and to a hospital that's so open um, and receiving uh, of what I, I can 
provide. So it's, it's just been a really good experience. Um, so yes. So, um, Liang, who I had told you is, um, kind of my sidekick, um, the yin to my yang. <laughs> oh, I'd never thought of that one before. That's kind of funny. Sorry, I'm making myself cry. That's all right. That's all right. I do it all the time. <laughs> That's something I do. Um, so, so she didn't need an American name. She didn't want an American name, but um, some of the other um, staff members have are really excited about you know in, learning English and excited about the American culture, um, and you know, have come into my office and said, Oh, I really want an American name. Will you think of an American name? And I'm thinking, who the heck am I? Like, I shouldn't be like to name you, (laughs) but you know, they do, they do. They want that. So, and so I do, I kind of like think of somebody who they may remind me of, um, and give them a name of, you know, of someone that reminds me of someone at home. So I have another Carly in my clinic and I had a Carly in my other clinic. <laughs> I see. And they're so, really into this. That's, that's, that's so oh, yeah. fascinating. Um, so, and then there are people who maybe they had an American name, um, but their parents gave it to them and they, they may think it's kind of like an Evelyn or something that's a little bit, you know, an older name and they want kind of a more, they'll say, give me a modern name. <laughs> oh, wow. So that is, uh, that's fascinating. Um, something that, again, I couldn't predict that as uh, when we started this conversation. So that's 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 pretty cool. Um, so, oh, and I also can tell you, I have a Chinese name. Um, yeah. So T- TH can be hard for some people who speak Mandarin. It can be for some, and one of those people was my uncle Jack. And so, as I had said earlier, I. Jack was in my life. My uncle Jack was in my life since I was three years old. And so he could not say Beth. He said Bessa. Bessa is really how it kind of translated. And so I introduced myself as Bessa, B-E-S-S. And there's a little eh on the end there. I see. Um, I see. So that's kind of my Mandarin name is Bessa, named Very. by my uncle Jack. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, so it sounds like with the... I want to get back to the scaling of the mm-hmm. organization piece. You know, I know you're just at APBA hanging out with some mutual friends. Uh, and um, are you are you trying to recruit other um, uh, North American or other just practitioners in general to, to go out there and help you guys expand? Or um, uh, or is it mainly the focus is developing the, the human resources yeah. uh, back so in China is- or... Yes. Um, Okay. Yeah. So the focus is to use the resources that are in place um, or building up in-house resources. Um, and and in, in, in terms of the scalability, when I, when I got to the organization, there was no mission. There was no vision statement, no vision statement, no mission statement, no ethical guidelines, no policies and procedures, no parent handbook. Um, and that is because this clinic was kind of put together to address a community issue. Um, and they had limited resources. So they just kind of put things together to the best of their ability, um, and got the services going and didn't have that organizational experience. Um, and so it's been a huge opportunity for me to use, uh, resources from our field, um, in terms of thinking about, especially the, the values based, um, that, uh, ideas that are coming from, um, act, um, and having that vision and mission statement drive the organization. Um, and so that's where I started with scalability is making sure that we have a vision and a mission statement that are, that our values are embedded within those statements. Um, and so that will help with the decision-making process as we go along. Um, and of course, um, you know, quality and, um, being humane, humane treatment is a, is really a, a large part, um, of what we, Dr. Lynn, Dr. Liu and myself all want to focus on. Dr. Liu, um, the, the woman, Dr. Lynn's mother really has always been, um, forward thinking in terms of her ideas about humane, 
uh, treatment and humane practices in the medical field, especially in in fertility and working in stem cell re- research and genetics. So it was easy um, to kind of come on board ship with Dr. Liu in that way and know, okay, we have the same value that we're going to put humane treatment right at the forefront and what that means for our clients, but also what it means for our staff um, and in terms of values. So that's that's where where I started the process um, is looking at those two things. Um, how does that work in terms of the supervision piece is I work with my supervisees and my staff on I interact with them like they're all going to become leaders. Um, and imparting on them the importance of self-advocacy. Um, part of that is sharing your own v- vulnerability as a practitioner. Um, and so I've had the experience myself that the more vulnerable I am, um, creates an environment where your staff and your practitioners can become also vulnerable because if they see the leader being vulnerable, it kind of sets the environment, um, that, okay, maybe it's okay. If she can share some things that she struggles with, then, then perhaps I'm not going to be attacked or judged. Um, and it won't impact, um, when I make a mistake that there'll be support here versus judgment. Um, and so that kind of goes back to that for me, that's, that's providing a humane working environment where we want people to be free to make a mistake. Um, part of learning new things is, is taking risk. And when you take risks, you are going to fail. I have failed many, many times, but those failures, Oh, you're always learning something from those failures, how to do better. Um, and I think that's the same space, that space of vulnerability also to me has some, some relationship with motivation, building some motivation to do better. Oh, there's the hashtag. That's right. That's right. Dr. Mo- there you go. <laughs> hashtag do better. I'll do a little, little shout out to Megan. Um, but to always push yourself to be doing better. So vulnerability, I made the mistake. What did I learn? Okay, now how can I do better? Right. So it kind of builds in motivation. I'm hoping and wanting to see in my staff to seek out other resources and seek out each other, um, about what they can do next. And I want that. That's what's so important in scaling is you have to have that, that tone. I don't want that tone to get lost. So how do you not lose that tone? You have to focus on the staff and the leadership, um, and those qualities and values that, um, are important to your organization. So I don't know. I hope I was able to answer your your question. Yeah, no, it's great. It's great. Um, I want to switch gears here a little bit and talk about some of your work when you're not doing this stuff. Uh, but, is sure. there, is, but before we do so, is there anything that we've left on the table? I'm sure there's probably lots of stuff, but um, anything else you want to um, say about yeah. your, your work over I in China before we... That I kind of wanted people to know because I thought that they, people um, who are in our field might find interesting is I kind of pulled... Um, data from the BACB website to look at what is happening in China. Um, and I was lucky enough to meet, meet uh, Neil, um, who um, does some international work for the board. Um, I, I just met him this past weekend, so I'm looking forward to developing uh, a relationship and, and finding more resources through Neil. Um, but so I took the... Um, the data, and this was from January 2019. So there's already been another uh, testing um, window that has just been finished. So I don't have, I just have from January. Um, but so there are, it's interesting there, um, at that point, there were 88 BC ABAs in all of China, 69 BCBAs, and six BCBA Ds. Um, and so when you, and then I, I, I plotted it on a map using, I think, yeah, some, some, yeah. So I used a, a map app where you can plot the numbers onto a map and I got to see the hotspots that are around China, um, of where people are, are practicing. Um, and so there is a hot spot um, in South, the Southern part of China over by Hong Kong. Um, and then there's also a little bit 
really smaller, but, but, but hotspot meaning, you know, like two or three, um, in Beijing as well. Um, and then in Shanghai and then the rest is, is kind of distributed in, in different places, um, across the country. Do so, you, would you mm-hmm. be comfortable sharing that? I will share that. Yeah. If yeah. you uh, send that to me, I can put that in the show notes for this episode. So if you want to check that map out, they can go to behavioralobservations.com and uh, look up this particular session. Sure. Sure. I'd be happy to do that. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be working on also adding by university, um, and by province, um, in probably the coming months. I'm not going to commit to a particular date <laughs> just yet, For sure. uh, but in the coming months. And so as I get those, I'll give those, I'll give those to you too. Sure. Well, awesome. It's awesome to see the field grow the way it has certainly here in the, you know, the United States and Canada, it's growing like, you know, growing like a weed, as they would say. And uh, um, but to see that happening elsewhere is certainly uh, certainly great news to hear. So, right, it, it is exciting to see. Um, okay, so the kind of things that I'm doing outside, I mentioned that I uh, last year I was the president of Arcaba. So um, last year um, spent working on that that. Uh, annual conference we have here um, in Arkansas. Um, And this year I'm past president, so I have less of a role, but I'm still um, involved. Um, And so there are some things here that have to have to have happen in the state. We do have insurance coverage. um, um, And, you know, I've been working on a Medicaid project um, with some local behavior analysts as well. You guys have Uh, licensure? And we don't have licensure. Yeah, same here in New Hampshire. Yeah, I just saw that during the uh, Jim Carr's presentation. The the few states that don't have licensure <laughs> yet. So yeah, we have to be kind of strategic in in, in what we're doing with that. So um, so that's something um, something to be spoken about. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. Awful. We have it in Vermont. We have. I think we have it in all the surrounding states, but uh, the Grant. Uh, New Hampshire is, uh, uh, yeah, not, not yet. Um, but, um, so that's coming. And then the other thing that I, um, ended up getting involved with, um, is this company called behavior me, um, where there are, uh, four people, um, in the company. Um, and one of them is Annie Escalante, who is a behavior analyst and, um, Andrea, and I don't know how to say Andrea's last name. Belange, um, and Andy Chavez and Chris Medina. Um, and so I was introduced, um, to them and through Ryan O'Donnell and because I was doing things in China and they wanted to speak to me and, and we got on a phone call and following that, um, we kind of hit it off. We just gelled really well. I love what they're doing. So they're used, they're looking at, um, virtual reality and behavior analysis. Um, and at that time they were specifically focusing on, um, safety skills for children, um, with autism and developing, um, simulations that could be used by behavior analysts, um, with, um, students on the spectrum to teach about, um, crossing the road, um, recruiting, um, a person in a park for safety, exiting, a, um, a burning building, um, TSA line. And I'm forgetting one. Did I say crossing the street, crossing the street? I think so. Yeah. Um, and so I would give them feedback, um, about these different simulations as, as they were progressing and our conversations evolved and, um, you know, they were asking me from also for my feedback as a clinician and as a director, um, in terms of, of sales. Um, and I just thought for, for centers, this just seems like an amazing opportunity to be able to, to use the technology that they have to do some research with kids. And I thought this is just a win-win for clinics, um, to be able to have some new technology and look at how this can work. And 
I know parents just really like to hear about new things <laughs> and we're using, you know, a science that it's evolved, of course, but you know, there are still some procedures that are really old, right? So it can also be interesting for parents to hear that a place is using something like virtual technology in the education of their child. So I thought that, that was, you know, another, a, a great point. Um, and through these ongoing conversations, they asked me if I wanted to kind of get involved with them on a different level. And we kind of came up with this idea of doing a brand ambassador um, because I'm just always kind of pumping them up. Uh, I love what they're doing. I love who they are as people. Um, and so I'm happy to be able to help bring brand awareness to Behavior Me. Um, it's so exciting for me to see somebody doing something using modern technology in our field and the application it just, to me, is so open. There are so many possibilities. Um, since the time that they've started, they've kind of moved more going to be focusing on staff training and using virtual reality um, to address the staff training needs. Anybody who's doing center-based work knows that, and, and probably home-based too, um, knows that staff training is such a time suck um, on all of us, On so it really drains resources. Um, and so if virtual reality can alleviate some of that drain, well, I'm all in on that. So um, being able to give them feedback on those kind of simulations and going forward. Um, and so they're kind of still, they have one simulation um, that is a functional analysis and that is web-based right now. Um, and so it's, it's exciting to think about how all the different ways that we could use virtual reality in terms of training. Walmart is already using, there are, there are big companies, big corporations. Yeah. In training I've, I've had their training. So it's, it's like, it's so obvious to do, but it's going to take some work to have the buy-in happen um, in our field, but it is a way that we can move our field forward for sure. Yeah. I have had the opportunity to, to speak with Annie and Andy uh, in the past, and in fact, we're having those guys come back on the show w along with some other folks, and we're going to do a tech and ABA episode coming up, uh, hopefully in the near future. So we'll we'll dig into behavior me and some other interesting tech applications in our field as well. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to hearing more about that because I'm uh, more of a luddite, and uh, so it's good to get that that you know. <laughs> prodding to to kind of get with the time so um that that's that's pretty neat and i can tell why they were uh, drawn to you as brand ambassador because uh you know i don't know if this will probably come through in audio but we're on skype so i can see you and yeah. i can see the enthusiasm that you're with which you're you're speaking about this so that's pretty clear but it also sounds like they they kind of went to you and said like i we this is a thing we think will work but you're pretty based in, in, in reality. So like, do you think this actually works and that that's sort of right. thing? And so I think that that's a, that seems to be a nice, uh, some complementing skill sets there that, uh, you know, that you could say, well, yes, I think this would be helpful here. Uh, it would be better like this or, you know, this not so much. And, and so you're kind of like the, uh, the reality tester, if you will. Absolutely. Um, and um, I, I will be, since I said that I, you know, use vulnerability, I will be vulnerable and say, I, I did submit a grant uh, proposal to ABAI for the international dissemination. So I may or may not get it, but um, you know, we're wanting to bring this also over to China um, and be able to translate that um, and, and see how it goes. So yeah, so we'll see. I hope I, we'll see what happens with the grant. So oh, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, very good. So uh, I know you just came back from APBA. Um, are you going to go to ABAI? Yes, I'll I be see. at ABAI, um, and Behavior Me will have a booth, a table there. So I'll, I'll probably, you'll probably see me around there with my Behavior Me T-shirt on, <laughs> giving out, doling out stickers, and getting people to follow Behavior Me on Instagram as well. I got to get all of my plugs in, Matt. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> and that's some um, behavioral observation stickers while you're at it. I'll, I'll, I'll hook you guys up. <laughs> Exactly. I got to order some more since uh, Jen handed up all of them out, a lot of them out this weekend. Um, yeah. It's a kind of a inside baseball story, but uh, well, um, but anyway, um, what uh, one other thing I want? Oh yeah, so 
um, whatever events that you're going to be doing at ABAI, just let me know and I'll put those in the show notes for this episode as well. Okay. So, right. uh, okay, so great. people, uh, I'm sure if, if there are people attending and want to uh, learn more about you and what you're doing and things like that, they can come find you where you, where you are. So, right. all right. Um, so let's, let's, uh, this has been a great, uh, uh, conversation, a lot of fun. I've learned a lot, uh, certainly. Um, and um, I think it's probably uh, piquing a lot of interest amongst folks about, uh, you know, working in, in different cultures and you know, how, to, how to bring behavior analysis uh, out, outside of its home here. Mm-hmm. Um, so let, let's wrap the show up here with the question I always like to end with. And uh, I, I know it's a bit of a left turn as far as a segue, but um, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Um, so what, what advice do you have for a newly minted BCBA? Okay. So I, I think the most important thing for somebody newly minted is to always know what you don't know and just go after it. We, including myself, we need to get out of our own way be vulnerable, open up, be honest about what we don't know and seek out people doing research. And be, I, I like to do cross-referencing where I, I look at an article in that area that's interesting. And then I go and I follow all of those references, look at them in the back and I start there and I move forward. I don't do, of course, I'm not reading every single article in the area, but I pick ones of interest and I keep going and I kind of string it all the way up to current. Who's doing what now in that area? And I, I just go right up to the people and ask them questions. I also email people and don't be afraid to reach out to people you may consider experts. Um, You may get one here or there that kind of is a little off putting, but overall people are so excited to share their research. Can you imagine producing research and having somebody email you and ask you a question about what your jam is. Most people are so excited to share. So just go after it, go after it and don't stop going after it. You know, I have, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and I, um, have had that experience myself emailing yep. people randomly to get a reprint of a paper or to ask a follow-up question or ask if they've tried X, Y, and Z with some other population and things like that. And I'm always pleasantly surprised. Uh, and I should perhaps start, stop using the term surprised at a certain mm-hmm. point um, because it's now more normal than anything else for people to yes. respond very enthusiastically uh, because as you say, they, you know, it's very reinforcing to them to talk about the stuff that they're devoted. They just happen to have devoted their life to studying. They're right. uh, yeah. So, um, they're, they're usually super psyched to, uh, uh, talk about it. So, all right, cool. Uh, Beth, this has been great fun. Uh, Thank I will, you, uh, I will, uh, come see the behavior me booth at ABAI this year. So I will see you in, a, uh, I guess in a few weeks in Chicago. So thanks so much for joining me great. today. Okay, thank you again, Matt, for having me. It was my pleasure. Same here, bye. Bye Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.